Hi Mike, welcome back to Italy, welcome to Linea Rock. Grazie. Um, this time you're here with a new band, brand new project, Winery Dogs. For a brand new band. Brand new band, this okay. This is a new project, this that. is a real band. Okay, that's actually my first question, because I know you don't like the super group definition. I don't mind it. Okay, but you, you prefer like band, right? Well, this is definitely a band. The Winery Dogs is something that myself and Billy and Richie view as something with long-term potential and something that we want to treat as a real band. Um, many things I do, other things I do like Transatlantic and yes. Flying Colors, I mean those are more side projects more. because everybody has so many other things and it can only happen every couple of years yes. depending on everybody's schedule. But with the Winery Dogs it's something that me, Billy and Richie want to make a priority and something that really is uh, an ongoing thing okay. in, in each of our lives and careers. Okay, so this is definitely This a is band. my new band. But you must admit that see you three together is mm. like the show in the show because you're all it's fantastic like a, it's musicians. It's a three ring circus. <laughs> yeah. You don't even know where to look. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I mean. And uh, so this is actually uh, a super group. And uh, usually with super groups it's difficult, you know, because there's so much talent. You, uh, you want to say ego, don't you? <laughs> okay, You're well, saying talent, okay, but I think you say, mean ego. Okay, ego and talent, both. So it's not maybe easy, but you're all friends, right? So this started as a friend's band. How did it start? It started, well, the, the history, um, it began with me working with John Sykes, yeah. which was a whole separate thing. And I was working with John for a while, and I talked John into bringing Billy Sheehan on board. So Billy came on board, and after several months of kind of just waiting and waiting and waiting to take the next steps, and John was very um, hesitant to move forward and commit and move, you know, and, and take those steps. Billy and I got impatient and said, "Look." Why don't, we, why don't we move on and do something different? Yeah. We like the idea of doing a power trio together and working together and forming a new band. So th at that point, uh, we started looking for a new person to work with. And our good friend, Eddie Trunk, um, mm -hmm. suggested Richie, and it was a perfect suggestion. It was uh, exactly what we were looking for. And the first thing I did was ask Billy if there were any issues with the two of them yeah, from the Mr. Big, Mr. Big days. Thing, yeah. And Billy was like, no, no, Richie's great. That would be perfect. So uh, we, the three of us got together and then that's when the Winery Dogs was born. Okay. You know, a clean slate, fresh beginning. And once the three of us began work, that's when it began. So it, with John, it wasn't the Winery Dogs. No, it was no. a different thing? With John, it was a whole separate thing. It was all John's material. He okay. wasn't collaborating with me and Billy. It was just his material. He wouldn't mm. even pick up his guitar and play with us. Okay. Like he would only have me and Billy play to what was on tape. So it was a very, very different thing. Once Richie came on board, fresh slate, and we collaborated on everything. And it was all about the three of us working together and making this music and this band together. So you compose the songs, the three of you together, all new songs, or all each of you brought some ideas from, well, I don't know. The first okay. seven or eight songs we wrote were just collaborating, jamming from scratch, and uh, you know the three of us just working together. And then once we had about seven or eight of those written, at that point we started looking at some things that Richie had on the shelf, you know, ideas and demos and stuff. So we took down some of those. Some of them we worked on together and changed up a bit. And then there were a couple that we just left as they were okay. because they were so good. So. You know, I'd say a good 80% of the album was all together, completely collab collaborated, and then, you know, the other 20% were things that Richie had okay. that we worked on together. Was it quick? I mean, you were Very, all so good, so I mean... <laughs> it was incredibly quick and natural okay. and, and... Easy and... Uh, yeah, I mean, literally, I mean, I've already said this elsewhere, but it's the truth. Literally, within the first day of playing together, we had written four or five songs in wow. like in one day you know that's how quick and easy it was just totally natural and everybody um, was doing his own thing or actually maybe you suggested something to Billy and Billy was like asking a feel to you I mean how was it I mean it was um, you know those first seven or eight songs that we wrote spontaneously it would be like you know like like one more time Richie would play the opening riff 
and then me and Billy would join in. It's like, okay, well, there's the riff, that's the verse. And then we would say together, why don't we go up a fourth for the chorus, or why don't we do, try a bridge in this key, or, uh, you know, and then let's, you know, we would talk about the arrangement, and from there we would shape it together. Or in the case of, like, um, the other side, like I started playing a beat, and then Billy joined in, yeah. and then Richie joined in. And okay. It was, it was truly a collaboration. Those first seven or eight songs was just in a room, and it could be a guitar riff, it could be a bass line, it could be a drum beat, it could be a vocal melody, and we would just shape it together. Did you film the composition? I did. Okay. Yeah, I, fi I film everything. <laughs> okay. Um, and I put out a DVD of the drum cam footage of, uh, of the making of the drum cam, of the making of the drum yeah. tracks, but then in, in there, there's some Easter eggs, some hidden Easter eggs. Okay. I don't think Billy and Richie even know about it. <laughs> there's some Easter eggs that show us behind the scenes, like writing and talking and oh, wow, working great. together. Great. I know there's a very special song for you in particular on this mm -hmm. album, which is You Saved Me, mm -hmm. which is dedicated to your wife. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us something about it? Why now, actually? A song for her. Um, well, after... After I left Dream Theater, to be honest, I didn't think I was going to write lyrics anymore. Even before I left Dream Theater, I didn't think I was going to write lyrics anymore. After the Black Clouds album, I had f completed my 12-step suite that I had been writing, and I also wrote a song for my father on that album. And after that album, I felt like I, felt like I said everything I wanted to say. So uh, I thought I was done, and then... Uh, we were working on the Winery Dogs album and this one song musically just reached out to me. I kept hearing melodies. I had these melodies in my head. And lyrically, I was inspired to write about something. Um, you know, I, I wanted to write a thank you to my wife mm -hmm. for all the unconditional love and support she showed me over the, the couple of years since leaving Dream Theater. You know, after I left Dream Theater, there was so much drama and backlash yeah. and negativity that it showed me who my real it shows you who your real friends are mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people that I thought were close to me that turned their back on me and did very deceptive things to me and uh, but you know through all that my wife and my kids they stood by me unconditionally and it was times like that it shows you you know that family is is that's true love that's forever family is forever so I wanted to write a thank you to my wife for that mm -hmm. and uh, you know, this one song that we were writing with the Winery Dogs kind of spoke to me. And, you know, I think that's, for me, the best way to write lyrics. I, I never liked having to write lyrics because I had to write lyrics. I want to write lyrics if I have something I want to say or if, you know, if there's something that inspires me. If, I'll, I'll write lyrics in the future if it's something I want to do, but it's, I don't want it to be something I have to do. Okay. Um, you kept yourself pretty busy in the last three years. Um, pretty busy? Pretty busy, let's say. Okay. Um, how is um, the Winery Dogs experience different than anything else you've done in the last three years? Well, every experience over the last three years is different. I've had, um, I've had situations where I was a hired gun, like with Avenged Sevenfold, yeah. and I played a gig with Stone Sour, and I played a gig with Fate's Warning. Yeah. Uh, that's one kind of role. I've had uh, situations where I was like a session guy, like playing drums on the new Big Elf album. Yeah. That's another kind of role. Then I had something like Adrenaline Mob, which was a, a band that I was a part of, but it kind of, the music was there before I came in. Okay. So that was a different role. Then I have situations like um, Transatlantic and Flying Colors, where I am very much a key role and a key component and almost a band leader in some respects, but it's you know everybody is very involved and I have to play a certain role like that like half leader but half yeah. you know equal member and, and collaborator but in those cases those are more part-time projects because everybody's in other things and then you have the winery dogs which is uh, I'm not a leader you know all three of us are are equal members in this band it's very much a new band from the beginning from scratch writing together making decisions together uh, you know, me, Billy, and Richie kind of all have to learn each other's places because all three of us have histories of doing things in other bands and having yeah. a certain level con of control in each of the bands that we've had in the past. So there's a lot of compromise and give and take and a lot of, you know, learning what each other's strengths and weaknesses are and trying to 
delegate roles depending on that. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of trust involved. So in all these situations of everything I've done over the last three years, I've had to play different roles in each band. It's not like with Dream Theater, I was very much like a, a leader, quote unquote leader, that made all the decisions and didn't have to, you know, discuss every one of those decisions. I just made them. Uh, I haven't had that situation in, in any of these other things I've done. All these other things, I kind of have to come in and feel out the chemistry and feel out the personalities and then play different roles depending on the situation. Back to the hired gun thing. Um, you've done a lot of things very different also uh, from each other. Um, does it take more courage, open mind, or the fact that you are, you know, technically amazing helps and you just go and, and do it? I, I enjoy both sides. I mean, I really enjoyed uh, playing with Avenged Sevenfold and just playing drums, okay. having no creative input, uh, you know, just being a hired gun. And it's the same like, uh, you know, when I work with Neil Morris, I work a lot with Neil Morris on his solo albums and tours yeah. and in those cases it's Neil's thing and I'm very comfortable just playing drums if he wants my advice or input I'm there for for him uh, but I know my role in, in that, that situation is to just play drums so in those cases it's actually a relief I don't think I could ever do that full-time because mm -hmm. there's definitely a you know the leader inside of me that needs to have control over a lot of situations but it's a refreshing change of pace every once in a while to have a situation like that. Yeah. It's, it's like going to the gym for you, I mean, in a sense that you just play and free your mind uh, when you do the higher gun yeah. things. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's nice to, in those cases, just be a drummer. Yeah. And then there's other cases in other situations where playing the drums is the least of my thoughts and concerns. Yeah. I mean. Some of these other bands, you know, I'm, I'm overseeing, you know, the videos and the, the sequencing and the set list and the merchandise and yeah. all that kind of stuff. So in those cases, the drumming is just a small part of what I do. Yeah. So I kind of have to find my role and my, find my place in each one of the yeah. different bands and chemistries. Um, did you change your set and also your drumming approach for this record since it's more classic rock than anything you've done before? Yeah, big time. I mean, my, my, drum, my drum kit with the Winery Dogs is it's just a small classic rock John Bonham five-piece kit. I don't think anybody has ever seen me play on anything like that. You know, I've done a, a Zeppelin tribute and a Beatles tribute yeah. on small kits, but those were tributes to yes. some other drummers. This is the first time people are seeing Mike Portnoy being Mike Portnoy on a small kit, and it's fun. I mean, to me, I needed that change of environment. You know, I had spent 25 years with Dream Theater with the massive drum kit, and, you know, I, I don't want to always do the same thing the rest of my life. Yeah. I needed to, to kind of reinvent myself to be inspired and change is is mandatory for growth otherwise you're just sitting still and doing the same thing over and over and over so a big part of um, you know what I'm doing with the winery dogs is playing on a small kit and just kind of rethinking everything and it gives me a chance to find a, a something new inside of me and why now is the perfect moment to do something like that for you? I mean, you, you just mentioned you did tributes to the Beatles, the Who, and uh, Led Zeppelin in the past, so you kept it, you know, well, to the roots. But why now? It's there's always been a side of me that always had these huge classic rock influences, and I did these tribute bands with Paul Gilbert, yeah. the Who, and the Zeppelin, uh, the Zeppelin, the Who. Zeppelin and the Beatles, yes. you know, I had this stuff Rush, that wanted to come out. Rush. Well, Rush is more prog yeah, rock, but even I've done these uh, co cover to cover albums with Neil Morris where we're covering Chicago and Cat Stevens and yes. David Bowie and, <laughs> you know, things that are classic rock. Uh, that's always been a big side of me. Moody Blues, Procol Harum, Cream. Uh, so I, it's always wanted to come out, but I needed the right people to do it with. You know, doing that with Adrenaline Mob, it's not the right people, it's not the right format. 
you know, doing that with, I, I touched on it a little bit with Transatlantic a little bit, but Transatlantic is still very, very much a prog band. Yes. So I needed the right people. And obviously Billy Sheehan and Richie Kotzen are the right people to finally get this side of me out with. You know, those guys come from this type of background as well. Neither of those guys come from prog bands or even metal bands. So it was once I was in this new um, environment with, with Richie and Billy that, okay, this is, this is the right band for me to tap into that background and, and, you know, give me a creative outlet doing this style of music in an original band. Yeah. Do you have a fixed set list or you change every night and do you fill in songs from your previous bands or it's just Winery Dogs and maybe some covers? Uh, it's a fixed set list. I mean, when you're a brand new band and you only have one album out, you can't really rotate the set list that much. There's sure. nothing to choose from. So in this case, you know, it's our first time going around the world and, you know, we have one set list that I think is a, is a great set list for this band and an introduction to this band. So. You know, each of these places playing for the first time, this is the right set list. And basically we play the whole album, uh, everything we've written, including the bonus track from Japan. And then we play uh, a cover song, and then we do different songs from um, mainly Richie's past. We do one of his solo songs. Okay. We do one song of his and Billy's from Mr. Big. And then he plays one of his songs acoustically uh, from when he was with Poison. Um, you know, that's the appropriate stuff for this band. Like, it would have been inappropriate to do a Dream Theater song okay. with the Winery Dogs. It's just not right stylistically. Uh, PSMS and and Flying Colors did Dream Theater songs because mm -hmm. it was right for those bands. But for the Winery Dogs, we want to stick with stuff that's stylistically right. You know, mm -hmm. not prog, not metal. Something that, you know, stuff that fits within the style of this band. So this set list, I think, is a good representation of uh, what this band is about. Do you feel a backlash from the crowd every night? I mean, the show is different every night since you all have a lot of fans, each of you, you know, from your past career. Um, is I, that... We, we don't feel a backlash, no. Mm. We feel a tremendous amount of love and um, respect, I guess. Yeah. You know, it seems... I think more than anything I've done, including Dream Theater, yes. this seems to be the most universally embraced thing I've ever done. Uh -huh. Because even Dream Theater, which, you know, obviously I spent 25 years and we grew to a very, very big level, yeah. there were still people that don't get Dream Theater. It's mm. still not everybody's taste. You know, some yeah. people like it, some people don't. No, same with the Adrenaline Mob, same with yes. anything else I've done, except for the Winery Dogs. Winery Dogs, so far, the reaction has been like everybody enjoys it. The shows, the album, you know, it seems to be a style of music that I guess is is so much easier to just grasp. You know, it's a more of a universal, timeless type of style. So even at the shows, you know, maybe people are coming in, they're just Mike Portnoy fans, Richie yeah. Kotzen fans, and Billy Sheehan fans. You know, being it's the first album and first tour, not everybody knows the album yet. A lot of people are coming in from our three individual fan bases, but they're leaving Winery Dogs fans. Okay. Absolutely. Um, the album came out in May, uh, first in Japan. Exact. Um, do you have another record ready? I mean, no. I know that you're very prolific, you know, so... <laughs> no, we, we, we wrote and recorded this album, and once we did the album, then we had to start get the business side together okay. and look for... That was the reason it's been coming out at different times in different territories, because we have different record companies in okay. different territories. So Japan put it out in May, America put it out in July, and now here in Europe in September. It was just because different territories signed signed on and licensed it at different times. Yeah. Uh, after this world tour is done, we're gonna play everywhere we can, and you know, all through the end of 2014, once we've exhausted all the touring as we can, then we'll think about the next record then. And then once we do the next record, that will come out simultaneously everywhere okay. next time around. So that's weird. I mean, in the internet days, you know, I to know. have you know different release dates because you know everybody can have it. You know, when thought, it's out in Japan, it's out. You know, well, so. we thought it was going to be the death of this album. You know, the album yeah. came out in May. Yeah. And then you know, then the American record company said, "Well, we're not putting it out until July." It's like you realize everybody's going to have it. Everybody's going to download it. Yeah. But yet, when it came out in America, it entered the American charts in the top 30. So 
people got behind it and bought it anyway, so thank you for that. <laughs> but next time around, it'll all happen at the same time. Cool. Um, what happened exactly with the Adrenaline Mob, if you want to tell us about it? I mean, the fact that it was an important band for you. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah, you were I, very much into it, but I, what I, happened? I, I, um, I'm very proud of the album I made with the Journal Mob, and I think that there was really a great chemistry there. It was a great band. Yeah. I was definitely behind it, and I, you know, I spent, you know, two years of my life developing it and trying to, trying my best. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I came out of Dream Theater wanting to do a lot of different things, yes. and I wasn't ready to commit exclusively right. to any one band. Mm -hmm. You know, I had just spent 25 years with one band and side projects obviously but committed to one band and uh, I said right from the beginning I was going to plant many different musical seeds and see which grew and that would kind of dictate where I would go and what I would do and uh, you know I spent a good solid two years um, giving my all to Adrenaline Mob but you know uh, it, it only blossomed a little you know I kept waiting for it to truly blossom and waiting for touring opportunities to come around, which never happened, and you know, waiting for certain things to happen that never happened. So when it came time for them to start to want to do a new record, it's like, well, I have five months of winery dogs on the dates on the calendar, so I had to make a decision. Okay. You know, I couldn't be in two places at the same time. Uh, so I was, you know, luckily up until now, I've been able to juggle all these different things and make the schedules work out. But finally, it came to a head where it's like, okay, do I do a record with Adrenaline Mob or do I tour with the Winery Dogs? And it's like, well, you know, Adrenaline Mob is not really okay. growing fast enough. I, I don't have time to get into a van and play to 100 people a night, you know, for the next 10 years to develop this when I have other opportunities and things like the Winery Dogs and other things that are offering opportunities yeah. and, and situations that I need to follow through with. So I had to make a decision and, uh, you know, yeah. one shoe had to drop and unfortunately it had happened to be Adrenaline Mob. <laughs> Great band and I, I would have loved to have done more if they could have worked around my schedule, but I understand that they want to keep working. So it came to, you know, I had to make a decision and the Winery Dogs has a lot of buzz and opportunity and, and possibility and potential. So I didn't want to, uh, not give it a, ch a fair chance. Yeah. It was September three years ago that you. Three years ago. Yeah, yeah, three years ago that you made that shocking announcement that nobody expected. Um, do you still feel uh, that Dream Theater uh, is a main part of your career? Do you still feel that as your band? Um, how do you leave that? I mean, you've done a lot of things. But, well, you I, know, everybody say, still say, you know, Mike Pornoy from Dream Theater. So it's I know. <laughs> I mean, I will forever be linked to Dream Theater and associated with Dream Theater. It was 25 years of my life. That's yeah. more than half of my life. You know, I know Roger Waters will always be associated to Pink Floyd, sure. even though uh, he was only in Pink Floyd for what, 60, under under 20 years now, actually. Well, no, I. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was in Dream Theater longer than Roger Waters was in Pink Floyd. But sure enough, Roger Waters will always be associated with Pink Floyd. So I have no issue with that. And, um, you know, that's a huge, huge part of me that I devoted my life to. So, um, but that's, I'm not there anymore. You know, it's 2013. I've moved on and so have they. Um, it's, you know. It's the way it is. Did you have the chance to see them live or to listen to the record? What do you think of Mangini's job? And you don't want to tell about it. <laughs> Not even going there. All right, okay. There's no winning, no matter what I answer. Okay. Um, in 2006, you finally met one of your heroes, Neil Peart from Rush. Uh, what do you remember of that day? And was it exactly as you expected it to be? or? Uh, yeah, meeting Neil for the first time was, um, you know, he was he was always my hero when I was a teenager, one of my biggest drum heroes. And all those years of Dream Theater coming up and always being compared to Rush, and I was always compared to Neil in the drum magazines and things like that, but I had never met him and I never made contact with him. So 
it was always frustrating. Like, I want to meet him. I want to meet him so bad. And then when I finally met him in 2006, he was just such a gracious person. He was so nice, so um, outgoing to me. You know, I expected him to be so private, but he actually was so nice to me. And, um, you know, at first I was very nervous. He was always one of my heroes. But since then, you know, he and I have become very good friends. You know, now we, we email each other all the time. He'll send me pictures of, you know, him on his motorcycle or pictures of him and his daughter. And he'll send me his new book or new things like that when, when they come out. So, you know, and if we cross paths, he always invites me out to the Rush shows. Wow. And, uh, so he and I have really developed a great relationship. And, you know, it's kind of amazing when, when you think to when you're a teenager. You know, when I was a teenager, I would dream of even just meeting Neil yeah. Peart for one time. But now, you know, he and I are friends, you know, and, and uh, you know, I've played his drum set and at Soundcheck and, you know, <laughs> eaten dinner with him. So, yeah, you know, it's... And did you ever play together? We oh, we, we did play together, not at the same time, but we did a thing uh, for Sabian. We did a promotional thing okay. where me, him, and Terry Bozio and Dave Weckl, all of us were doing a thing where we would each play yeah. one at a time and watch each other and talk about each other's playing and stuff like that. Wow. So yeah, uh, and then I've played his drum set at, at Russia's sound checks and stuff. So Is he proud of you? I mean, that you... Oh, I don't actually. know. We don't talk... <laughs> you know, when, when, when Neil and I get together, I don't talk about him with Rush okay. and he doesn't talk about me. We talk about other things. We talk about family. We talk about drums, but not, not necessarily yeah, each yeah. other. Um, like friends, so, yeah. as you said, so it's, that's yeah. good, that's great. Um, your father worked as a DJ and you discovered rock music through his record collection. If you have to choose three records that really changed your life back in those days, very which easy. one would you pick? Oh, it's very, very easy. I mean, <laughs> uh, well, uh, two of them are easy, coming up with a third might be tough, but the two <laughs> very, very easy ones for me are Sgt. Pepper, and Tommy, you know, uh, the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper, the Who's Tommy. Those were the two albums when I was a kid that changed my life and still to this day are two of my favorite albums of all time. Um, another album from back then, uh, the Rolling Stones' Satanic Majesty's Request, which is a very obscure album yeah. of theirs. And it's my personal favorite album of theirs, but I know a lot, it's not a very well liked album of theirs, but for me it's one of my favorites. Because it was, you know, back in 67, 68, 69, those three albums, you know, is what I was listening to. Yeah. Tommy, Satanic Majesty's Request, and Sgt. Pepper. So those would be the three. And, and they were like very important records in the evolution of rock. Yeah. In those days. So. Absolutely. You're wearing a Van Halen t-shirt, but mm -hmm. you didn't mention Van Halen as one of your main influences well, or, or records to pick. But I could, uh, <laughs> I could name, in the top I could name 10. 100. <laughs> uh, Van Halen's not even in my top 10. I don't oh, think. no, really? No. I mean, I love them. I uh, love the first five Van Halen albums so much, and Eddie's one of my heroes, and Alex, and you know, but uh, God, I mean, there's so much music yeah. in my life, <laughs> you know, it's hard okay. to... You know, hard to fit them all into a top ten. Okay, so last question for today. Uh, so, what's in the can for Mike Pornoy at the moment? Just the Winery Dogs, or you have something else in mind already? Well, the Winery Dogs is my focus right now, yeah. and it's what I look to spend, you know, my time devoted to pretty much for the next year or so. We hope to come back to Europe next summer and maybe do some festivals and some more touring here. And, you know, so all throughout 2014, the winery dogs will be the, my focus on the road. Yeah. But that being said, there's still a million other things in the pipeline. <laughs> there's a, a new PSMS live DVD that just came out, a new Flying Colors live DVD that's coming out, um, a new Big Elf album that I play drums on that comes out next year. New Transatlantic album comes out in January, and we're going to do a European tour in March. So we'll be playing Italy. Uh, we're doing Milan and Rome, I think, at the beginning of March. Uh, I have a Progressive Nation cruise that I put together that's happening in February mm -hmm. with 23 bands. I mean, everybody from... I'll be playing with Transatlantic, PSMS, and Big Elf, but we also have John Anderson, Adrian Blue, King's X, Spock's Beard, 
Flower Kings, Penis Salvation, Beardfish, Riverside, Jolly, uh, Animals as Leaders, Periphery, wow. Safety Fire. I mean, it's just really an unbelievable event that, yeah. that I put together. So it's my baby, yeah. my project, and I'm very excited about that. Um, I think that's it. I, th I think that's so enough for now. So we're not going to miss you in the next no. few months. Okay, no, I'll be back good. with Transatlantic in March. <laughs> okay. and. Uh, and hopefully, you know, back with the winery dogs uh, by summer of next year. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Mike. Cool. Thank you.